Hello guys, it's Stephen here. Welcome back to a very, very special video. As you can see alongside me, I've got former Manchester City player, uh, someone I've actually cheered for in the stands myself, Nadim and Nua. Um, thank you so much, Nadim, for coming on, man. How are you doing? Are you okay? Uh, and I can't believe it. Thank you, man. No, I'm good. I'm good. Fine. It's good to finally be on the show, especially after we did meet up. I think it was, was it three weeks ago, something like that? So it's good yeah. that you finally invited me. This is a uh, great <laughs> Yeah, finally. So I've been busy, man. I've been, you know, I had so much to do during lockdown. Uh, it's been yeah, a bit of a weird time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, mm. you know, sometimes you just, you just got to wait for the, it'd be worth it in the end. And of course, we're here right now. Um, but Nadim, uh, people don't know. Some people are young, unfortunately. Some people are lucky enough not to sin through the pain that we've been through. So I'll give a little bit of an overview of Curie. If, um, if you are fortunate enough to have not been around when Manchester City weren't quite as successful as we are right now, Nadim kind of blurs that line. And uh, he's a lifelong mm -hmm. Manchester City fan as well i read this on wikipedia mate i'm not sure if it's true but apparently you were actually at the 1999 playoff final is that true i was yeah that's true yeah oh, that's, but i've got home hands up and say I, I was i was one of the people that left like as the <laughs> as the first goal went in i had left because i thought there's no point anyway but at that point i'm a child you know i don't really have to say but i was listening to the game so ultimately it was on my sort of radio walkman as i was sitting in mcdonald's eating and i was like yeah it turned out to be quite oh, a good day oh man Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, I guess it's all part of the memories anyway. But So, Nathan, Nathan yeah. played for Manchester City. You made his debut um, in 2004, I think, against Arsenal in the League Cup. And you made 116 right, yeah. appearances for Manchester City in the end, scoring five goals and played under the most eclectic collection of managers that you'll basically <laughs> see. Very Man City, basically. Kevin Keegan, yeah. Stuart Pearce, Sven Goran Eriksson, Mark Hughes, Mancini. And, of course, as well, towards the end, in uh, briefly in a squad alongside some of Manchester City's biggest legends, the likes of Vinny, Zaba, in Silva, Sergio, Yaya, Nigel Young, and so on. Uh, before, of course, moving on to Sunderland for a little bit, then QPR for a long time. Was it seven seasons there? Um, yeah, it was. Seven yeah. seasons, wasn't it? And then finally, mm -hmm. moving over to the MLS and Real Salt Lake City. Um, I've got to talk a little bit about um, retirement. You retired in December um, after right, yeah. three years. Um, why did you decide it was right for you to retire? And um, was there any particular uh, thing that you felt was the right time? So for me, having the family that I have, I've got three kids, uh, three young kids, and that meant that I was able to go and travel to the US because when I was younger and I was playing at City and so on, and in fact, it was more so when I left City, I yeah. used to watch football from all around the world. You know, I'm not somebody who just obsessed with what's on match of the day. Like, I'll be watching BT Sports, Satanta, all that stuff from back, in, from back when to look at everything. And I, I took, sometimes I took a greater interest in stuff happening outside of these shores than I did with stuff in the UK. And I always thought yeah. I'd love to be a part of that experience, experience because even for me as a person, I like to travel. So when the opportunity came where that could be a thing, I thought, well, instead of staying in England and you know representing good clubs, all that stuff, I thought, why not go somewhere with my family to the point where when you retire, you can talk about the experience itself as opposed to yeah. just the number of games that you've played. So I've, I play, I amassed however many games I've played in England, but now I can talk about what it's like to live in a foreign country, learn obviously they speak the same language, but learn a new culture, learn a new type of understanding, learn about football through somebody else's eyes. And yeah. that, was, um, that was great. But with that as well, I knew that for me, I was lucky enough to have made enough money to not have to be playing because I needed the income. And yeah. as time passed, I got to a point again where I loved my days off more than I loved going into training. Like, and don't get me okay. wrong, I love training and I love games, but I'm a family guy. And to be around my family, like that's that was more what was more exciting for me. And you know, you get older within the game itself, and it, it's fun and what whatever, but it's not the same as when. So, like, I'm going to playing games, and I'm going to the training ground and so on. And there's someone here who's 16 years old, so he was born the year I made my debut. And <laughs> I always try and like I measure old conversations. Old man him, yeah. <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. And I always measure conversations really in terms of like relatability. So for pe for pe people like you and I, we can talk about loosely about say euro 96 maybe usa 94 you know what i mean you can talk about yeah. whatever was in 2000 south korea and japan 2002 but when people were born in the early 2000s their closest point of reference as adults is like past the south african world cup you know what i mean and <laughs> with that conversations are just different and it's cool and i've got my friends and all that stuff but you very quickly i think start to become um you do become the old man in that space and I was playing well, I was in good health and all that stuff. But I wanted to be able to walk away from the game when I wanted to, as opposed to the game telling you that you have to leave. 
So as I said, I did yeah. I did well in my two and a half years there, but the plan was to always finish there, finish my career there, but then come back to England. And thankfully, I was able to do that in good health. I love the idea of you trying to talk about Gascoigne and Shearer and they're going, yeah, but have you seen this TikTok pointless. or something? <laughs> pointless. Um, Absolutely pointless, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And I, I guess that's something we don't really talk about a lot, like eventually family calls, doesn't it, man? That's something that you want to think about as you get older. I mean, we're, mm-hmm. I'm 35, you're 34, so we're roughly the same age. And that's I right, understand yeah. entirely those feelings. Um, um, you have a family, I don't have that yet, but I understand that sense of it calling towards you and everything seems starts to feel pointless, doesn't it? Because family quite literally yeah. is the most important thing. Um, yeah. So sure. do you have any other plans um, after retirement, basically? I, I put this out on Twitter and someone said, because um, I, I didn't mention yourself in the tweet, but I just said about uh, current footballers. And someone said, what plans do you make for your end of career? Um, and do you get any help from the PFA or clubs um, uh, past that point? Is, is there any kind of preparation for what may happen when that day comes and you finally hang up your boots? Or are you very much kind of left out to just kind of fend for yourself really um that's a good question that is a good question i think there can be things which are out there which will help you but you kind of have to seek them yourself because as time passes somebody could retire at 27 someone might retire at 40 so there's not going to be a point where someone taps you on the shoulder and says right you now have to start planning for retirement because this is the age when everybody retires because there is no set age as such like we know when pensions come and stuff but there's no set age in terms of when you should walk away because people have got different health, different desires, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's tough to have that. But then also I think it depends on the people's personality. So like I said, I love, I love playing football. It was such a privilege from day one till the point when I stopped. But I didn't want to necessarily continue in it because I don't rely on that. I don't love the fact that they're constantly being given a schedule. This is what you have to do. This is where you have to be. This is how you have to do things and so on. But I would say I'm more in the minority. So for lots of people who are finding that maybe their time is winding up, winding down, they want to go into coaching, they want to go into management, they want to do whatever they can to stay under the same roof as other as a football team to fall into that schedule because they need that. That's their identity. Yeah. But for me, in the in the years when I played, even though I was playing week in, week out, or whatever, I never classed being a footballer as being my identity. So if you met yeah. me on the street, and you didn't know who I was, I'd say, hi, I'm Nadam. But for some people, it's like, hi, I'm this person. I play football for this team. And this yeah. is who I am. This is what I do. And that subtle difference there, I think, is kind of what's the difference between, say, coming to the end of your career for someone like me and others like me, as opposed to other people who are desperate to either prolong the career for, career for as long as possible or are rich to not take any days off the moment they do, do retire and go straight back into that world. So there is... Um, like, for, like, I enjoy doing certain bits of media, but not too much because I retired to gain free time. So whereas we see someone like Micah who's doing the media and doing it very well and being everywhere, I don't envy I that because I, want, because I want to be free. I want to have the freedom to pick and choose what I want. And I'm sure he, like, he will have the financial freedom to be able to do that, but he also enjoys it and he doesn't mind the time that it takes. But for me, yeah. I, like, I value my time more so than that work itself. So um, I sense, guess... Yeah. Um, um, so I guess I mean we spoke um, at the We're Not Rehear show and you did say you didn't really consider going into coaching was there any particular reason was it simply because um, I guess everything you just said there where it's just a bit too much for you like um, it's not something that you're drawn yeah. to because I guess it never ends does it really otherwise no it doesn't it literally doesn't like um, I think the example was uh, maybe uh, Steve Bruce or something like that. He played like a thousand games as a player. He's now done a thousand games as manager. And he's been doing this from when he was like 15 years old or something. So for the, basically his whole life, he's been doing the same thing, turning up to games, turning up to the training ground consistently. And that bit post football where you have a choice, like I don't, it's not something that I wanted to pursue. That day, that everyday life of being involved in football can be great. And it has its plenty of merits, but it's not something that I literally have a desire to be a part of because I don't feel I need it. I do value my free time more. And if you value free time, going into management won't provide you with free time yeah. because instead of being the player who works from maybe eight till two or something during the day, now you're the manager who works from the moment you open your eyes to the moment you close them. Because even after work's done, after a training session is finished, you're speaking with your coaches, speaking with the board, speaking yeah. with the media, speaking with all that. And it's, it's relentless. And that doesn't get me going at all. But there are elements of 
what coaches and managers do, which I do buy into. Like, I like the feeling of trying to make people better, you know, the interactions and stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, definitely. And, and I think I'll like to pursue that going forward, maybe in some sort of mentoring thing or whatever, but just not specifically within the football environment. No, that makes sense. And I, I, to be honest, I can only imagine um, if I was in your situation, I'd probably feel very similar because, I mean, it's a big wide world. And I guess you, you didn't make yourself, you've got the, the, um, the fortune to be secure financially so you can invest in other areas. You can obviously kind of look to broaden your horizons a little bit. And of course, one of the things you have done, uh, you started obviously, of course, when you're a professional footballer, you started Kickback with Aiden, which is a fantastic podcast. And I would recommend everyone going to listen to that. And very least, the episode with Vinny, which is just um, mesmeric yeah. from the first minute to the very last. Um, how can we go into that, uh, mate? How can we got into that is that something you wanted to expand on in the future as well um it's it's a gen i'm not just trying to say it's because you're asked because it doesn't matter because you're here now anyway but like genuinely yeah. um it is a, a really really refreshing listen um what what made what what brought you towards that in general firstly thank you for the plug and secondly i think it was <laughs> um link in the description so below t- well, yeah, in terms of that's that's what we do on YouTube, isn't it? You know, we comment mm. down below, hit the subscribe button, Dove gets clicked, ring the bell so you don't miss out. <laughs> that, those are, those are all you're not allowed to be better than me already, man. You're not allowed to be. <laughs> oh, sorry, my bad, my bad. But with, with, the, with the stuff, I think when it comes down to media, um, as time got by, I enjoyed having conversations with the press and so on in a non traditional yep. way because you know there are points when you essentially get cliche questions, so you have to give cliche answers. But when they don't get those, I like to elaborate on things. So whenever there was the opportunity to do so, as podcasting and stuff got bigger and bigger, I started to do more of those, whether it was for the BBC or for a club or something, and people liked it. And then I was, I was a guest on a, a podcast with one of the women from the women's team that existed in Utah at the time. And yeah. as we finished, the, the producer said, would you be interested in doing one for the men's team? And it's not something I thought about. Yeah. But I, I thought... Okay, I don't see why not. And I was very, very fortunate because I understand for people like yourself and other creators, one thing which this stuff does, it takes a lot of your time. And even though the rewards can be what they are, like it takes a lot of your time. But for me, I was lucky yeah. enough to have a producer where I could, from the start, I could pick the guest, I could pick the content, I could record it and then leave the studio and it would be released by the producer at some point. So he's doing the editing, he's making sure the sound's good and I could yeah. just focus on the content itself. So he saw that he saw that you know i enjoyed having conversations with people and so on so that's how it began and then as time passed i grew to really enjoy learning what listeners want to hear like it trained my in terms of what i want to hear as well from podcasts youtube channels and things like this and the whole thing about bringing people on to tell stories which aren't really told because now we're in a spot i think with the podcast where the selling point is you you know you're speaking to me you're not speaking to somebody in the press we don't really talk about uh, current affairs. We talk about you, however you want to talk about it. And it's your chance for you to tell your story instead of letting somebody else tell it and you react to it. And yeah. when you provide people with that opportunity, you know, they, they sit back and they open up and they can actually just say things which they maybe wanted to have said for years. But in our world, we don't make public statements. We essentially just answer questions. But people now can, through a leading question, talk about the reasons why they were at this club or that moment in their career which they've never had the chance to explain or why they're doing what they're doing now and when they when they do like that I think you see as I said I think I'm like you in some ways I, I will sit down and I like to talk to people and I like to listen to people I like to listen to stories I enjoy conversation I enjoy back and forth and the premise of the podcast itself is called Kickback with Naden because if we were if it was you know different times and people were just around and we you know it's late at night or whatever and we start talking a lot of the questions I ask people on the show are questions I'd ask people in real life. Exactly, that's yeah. when you can really get to know them. And so that's how it started and that's what it's become. And in some ways it's, it's been, um, it, does take, it does take its time and especially finding the right types of guests. But I think the buy-in so far as we approach say episode 75 or whatever, it's gone a lot longer than I thought it would. But it's also brought a lot more stories than I anticipated as well. But I love, I love doing it. When I sit down and ask somebody a question and we go in a direction I never expected, at that point, I'm the same as the listeners. So that's when I know yeah. this is this is spot on. Yeah, this is perfect. 
No, I can totally relate to that. I think people um, often, there's an element of truth, I guess, but people often presume people who do what I do or so on. They just love the sound of their own voice. And I guess the simple yeah. answer is really, I just like talking. Like genuinely, I don't really think there's any point in human interaction in life if you can't just sit and talk to someone. That is the premise of why we are here, in my opinion, in general. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. The fascination of just sat and getting inside someone's head and, and hearing their own way of viewing something that you never would have thought of before. It's just, it's genuinely fascinating. Um, I want to get on to a little bit of City. We have to talk about City, man. I'm a Man City channel. You're a Manchester course, City yeah. fan, of, of course. course. Yeah. Um, and there mm -hmm. is loads of questions. Uh, we could probably talk for hours. We, we, none of us have got time for that. But I want to talk about one thing. Um, I'm not sure if it's bittersweet or not, um, but I know you've touched on this before elsewhere. You did leave just before things changed, unfortunately. You know, obviously, and the club went kind of strat mm -hmm. stratospheric. Obviously, we signed all these incredible players. Um, um, was there any regrets, in your opinion, from that? Um, did you just take it in your stride? Uh, because I guess if you'd spent, if you'd just fudged around a year later or something like that, it could have been Premier League trophy in your hands. I mean, how did you feel about that looking back? <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's a good question. It's a very good question. It's been phrased by somebody who understands football. And <laughs> I, for me, that, was the, that stretch from when Mancini came in to when I left was the toughest of my career because to that point, I'd played under every manager that came before. And now under my, like, I played in Mark Hughes' last game before he got sacked. So I played well in that game or whatever, but I got injured. But from when Mancini came in, I, like I was done. He decided myself and a few others, we were done. There was nothing we could do to get into his team and be consistently in that side. And quickly, by the way, Nadia, that, sorry. How, how does that feel well, quickly in that moment? Just when someone in manager decides? Not, like, like for me personally, looking back, I was, um, I think I was 23 years old. And looking back, that was young. I was very young at that time, but it felt like I'd been there because I started when I was 17. Six years in the first team feels like you've been around for ages. Yeah, when I was yeah. 23. And I remember there were certain points where, to be completely honest with you, I didn't say, uh, so I'd, I was playing centre back, but I'd play right back as well. And that's when Dedrick Boyata first came through. But yeah. Dedrick at the start of that season was a substitute for the reserves. But when Mancini was manager, Mancini brought him up from the reserves to the first team and then put him in at right back to make sure that like I, he was playing ahead of me because he really didn't want to play me and Dedrick had never played right back before whereas I'd essentially played it for six years prior so I was confused I didn't know what was happening um surrounded by the same players I was when I was playing a month ago or two months yeah. ago except now there's like there's nothing there's nothing for me and there's nothing I can do and I think in the past if you've got if someone's honest with you you can try and make better decisions if somebody says you're not good enough, you're not going to play, fine. But if somebody never says that, but they treat you in such a manner, you're always asking, well, why is this happening? Yeah, of course, yeah. Like, uh, to, talk about, to talk about my situation, there were quite a few players who weren't playing. And what you would do, so I'd, I'd, I'd maybe play in the cup game on the, I think this was just before I left, I'd play in a cup game on a Wednesday because I'd played in the League Cup or whatever. I played in the cup game on a Wednesday. Didn't play in the League game on the Saturday. But then I'd be playing a reserve game on the Tuesday. But there'd be people who didn't play on Wednesday or Saturday that wouldn't be playing in the reserve game on a Tuesday. And this happened for a few months. And it was only me from the first team that was dropping back to play in the reserves, even though there were quite a few of us that weren't playing. So I'm thinking, well, this is weird. So I went, I said, I got to a point where I said, I need to go and speak to himself. And I asked, I said, what's going on? And he said, what's, what's wrong? Do you not want to play? And at that point there, you're in a corner. And you're like, well, <laughs> I do want to play, but I can't ask, like, why is it just me? But he doesn't allow that. Like from when yeah. his mind was made up with Mancini, his mind was made up. So for me personally, being a City fan, being a Manchester boy, having played previously, to then all of a sudden be deemed to just be out of fans altogether. And for somebody to be essentially be, there was myself and a few others, we were essentially vilified. And I didn't think I didn't deserve it because I didn't take anything away from the squad. I was never yeah. disruptive. I was never anything like that. I came in, I worked hard, tried to get in the team. If I wasn't in the team, I'd support the team and make a difference, try and make a difference if I came on. That was it. But now all of a sudden I was like being portrayed as a villain by him. So that was very, very difficult. And so the, you came in, in like November time, 2009. I played a few games. But then the next season I, go, I went along to Sunderland. Um, and then when I was at Sunderland finishing off, I think I had the opportunity to sign there full time. But there were a few things about the way the club was where I thought I'd rather go back to City and maybe play half the games or whatever, but yeah. have the opportunity to try and win titles. 
that enticed me more than say staying at Sunderland that season. I said, I don't know if it was the right decision, but I went and said, I went and said to Roberto, I wanted to come back and play or get the chance to play. Come back, try and earn a place in the team. Yeah, of course, yeah. And then uh, that summer, I got. I was, remember I was on my honeymoon. I was in San Francisco and uh, we were in a helicopter under the bridge or whatever. I came down, voicemail, said, Roberto says you've got to leave. That was the voicemail that I had. Day one of my honeymoon, I was like, ah, it's a bit of a sticky <laughs> oh, one, isn't man. it? But anyway, oh, man. <laughs> kind of set the tone. But no no work anyway. honeymoon Pre- in that. Wow. No, exactly. Exactly. But then myself, uh, myself and maybe a few others, I think it was a Saturday before pre-season, pre-season was supposed to start on the Monday. And I got a text from Claire Marsden and she said, you've got to come in on the following Saturday. So I was like, oh, pre-season has been pushed back a week. But no, it was so the first team could train Monday and through Friday, leave on Friday to go to America. And then myself and the others would be trained with the under-16s from that Saturday. And again, I'm thinking to myself, what have I done to deserve this? Because I get that you're not part of the plans, but I think a skill of a manager yeah, to get it so that everybody that's there, even if you're not playing, is still like because you, you replace me then with say an under fifteen, under sixteen that's traveling to America who won't play for the first team, whose standard isn't the same standard that mine was, you know. But he decided myself, Fada Bayor, Bellamy, Wayne Bridge, Rocky Santa Cruz, or whatever. They said, "Nah, these guys aren't going to come with us." But that doesn't help a situation, in my opinion, no, because we could still go there and train, and we weren't disruptive. So. That was going on. The preseason was a nightmare. Whereas they were playing against like Inter Milan's in in Dallas, oh, we were playing against Staley Bridge Celtic and stuff like that. So it was it was a bit nuts. And I didn't, I wasn't with the first team at all until the transfer window closed and I was still there. And then it was the very first game of the Champions League era for Man City, and I was in the squad. I'd not trained with the first team for two months in preseason. <laughs> but now it's using me for the like for the homegrown quota or whatever. But in that next four months leading up to the January transfer window, I think he used me in the League Cup and I played one league game. And as a player, especially being 24, I think I was at the time, you're always in a spot where you know a career isn't long enough to be able to waste any years when you've got good health. Yeah. So I knew that he didn't want me there. I had to be trying to play. So I knew that I had to leave. But I always wanted, I wanted to stay because that's, that ended up being the moment where City won a league. And I was training with those players for that yeah. time. And it wasn't like I was a million miles off the pace or something like that. Like I was training with them. But if somebody, if, if the way football works, I'll argue just the way life works. If someone, said, if someone doesn't think that you're the right person for a situation, sometimes you can't fight it. And in a yeah, career, you have to look elsewhere. And I would, I would have loved to have stayed. I would have absolutely loved it. And I know that contributed a little bit to that season, but I didn't, I didn't win a league medal because I didn't contribute that much, but I felt like I could have done. But my hands were essentially tired and he decided enough was enough. And so um, in a weird twist of fate, given everything you've just said about Roberto and of course leaving the club when he did, um, you ended up, of course, then involved playing for QPR in possibly the biggest game in Manchester City's history, the 3-2 victory, the Aguero moment, an iconic moment. Um, I want to know, because I can't even imagine how you felt that day. As a Manchester City fan, as a guy who's just left the club in those circumstances, um, you're in front of the fans that have been cheering you for years. You've, you've, you've been there, sat in the stands as a fan as well. Um, and all of a sudden, you're a man tasked... <laughs> Uh, playing in this game to stop Manchester City win the Premier League. Um, of course, it probably helped that Joey was playing as well, next Manchester City lad there as well. But um, <laughs> how do you feel on that day, man? Like, where is your head at? Because I can't even begin to imagine the pressure that you're under to one, not mess it up, and two, play against your teammates while also at the same time trying to keep QPR away from relegation. But, like, where were you that day in your head? Well, to be honest, to reference the Joey Barton thing, I think I was a bit different to him. Because he uh, <laughs> just a bit, just a bit, but he uh, like he left City a longer time ago, so yeah, I yeah. was fresh off it. Like I left at the end of July, and here we were, basically the middle of May. And I, when I was leaving for QPR, I, I saw the fixtures, but I didn't think the last game was going to be something which would come into it. But it, it came into it the week before because we ended up beating Stoke for QPR. We ended up beating Stoke at home, and that ended up being the win that kept us up. But it now meant that we were going to City knowing if we get a positive result, then we definitely stay up. So yeah. that was like, that was weird. That, that was, I was weird because for that week leading up to the game, I was so nervous because I'm like, I'm coming back. I've never played against City before. You know, you, like it's the weird yeah, thing yeah. to get head around. Like I've always played for City. My next game is against City. And you just say it like it's a normal thing. But I've never, I've literally never done it before. 
this is all new to me to arrive in that dressing room. I've never even got, I've never, when you go down the steps, I've never turned right to the away dressing room. I'd always just turn left. I don't even know what's down there. It could be, it could be like a big black hole down there. I, I generally didn't know. <laughs> but now I was, I was coming back and I was, I was really nervous about all the different possible outcomes. And I was obviously thinking about City winning the league and so on. But my biggest concern was our side for QPR trying to stay up and how it was going to affect because I didn't leave City to be relegated. That was a big thing because I'd never played in the championship and I had championship offers in the past but to go on loan or whatever. But that wasn't really what my desire was. Like if I was good enough to be playing for City in the Premier League beforehand, I didn't think yeah. that I should essentially got dropped down to the championship. So I was worried. And I, like I'm somebody who airs on the side of sort of like negative outcomes even and then if it's a positive it's, it's like a big boost so i'm thinking to myself i can, I can like, relate to that i can relate to that definitely yeah i'm thinking so whereas you were thinking for city it might go wrong i'm thinking for me personally i might get relegated by city in the stadium i called home by my people who were calling <laughs> teammates and friends i have a fuck I'm life moment that, that. like oh it's horrendous that could have that could have been for me personally, that could have been one of the worst days of my career. Literally could have been. Because as I got to the stadium on, in fact, it was the day before, me taking the train to Manchester, that's me going home. That's not me going for an away game. Whereas yeah. for the QPR guys, that's an away game. Me, us staying in the Radisson. That's the Radisson. I used to stay there as a city player. Like, this is what we used to do. Walking you know, in the streets before the game. Piccadilly I'm as well. You're exactly. like, I know Piccadilly, exactly. man. You're, you're showing where exactly. going to get to Piccadilly, aren't you? You're telling exactly. me, go this way, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Day of the game, people say they want to go for a walk. I'm like, cool, come with me. I'll show you around because this is this is my this is my home. So we're doing all that stuff before the game. And then the game comes. I arrive at the stadium. I'm saying hello to every member of staff because I've spent the last six, seven, eight, nine years saying hello to them anyway. I could yeah. tell you everybody that works from the security staff to the tunnel staff to the cleaners, you know, to the chefs, everyone. Except now I'm the opposition, You're the and villain, that's man. a weird moment. Exactly. I, I, we're the potential villains, but we're the heavy underdogs as well. And there's a sense of, with the City team at that time, you could sense like they were focused, but also a bit nervous because let's we forget, for whatever City are now, things change from that moment because that's yeah. when, obviously, they won the FA Cup, but this is the chance to be at the top table when it comes down to Premier League history. This is, this is their opportunity. So there's a bit of something in the air. And we, we had something as well. And the way the game started, City, I think they must have dropped less than 10 points at home all season. So they were flying. We knew we were going to be massive underdogs and so on. But the game began, got in the flow. There was not, not really much to it. I think overall, looking back, it wasn't City's best game that season. Uh, no. Best game in that season. But I'm playing anyway, doing whatever we're doing. We're like relatively solid without doing anything. We're not having chances, not having shots, but we're just on the field. We don't need possession to be in a game. So they've got all the possession, moving the ball around and so on. And then Pablo scores. And as I saw recently, Pablo's goal is the forgotten goal of that, of that game because yeah, it was the one that put City 1-0 up in the first half. So going in at half-time, they were going to be champions. Pa Paddy Kenny, and wasn't we were, it? He flapped his hand at it, wasn't it? Was yeah. It, yeah. And he had a bit of a so, mare, didn't he? So, but... Listen, Paddy Kenny, for the time I was there, actually played well. Like He's, a, he's an iconic goalkeeper for the club. But on yeah. that particular day, if he had a better day, I think he saves maybe three of those goals, you know. <laughs> when you look at them, they're not. If you look, yeah, back, no, you're, you're right, you're right. It's, Even Sergio's, Sergio's is savable. Exactly, that. wasn't in the corner. Yeah. Um, and if he saves it, I wouldn't even say it's like the best save in the world ever. But you know, it is what it is. So this Pablo scores, and it's weird because I'm playing against these people who I used to call teammates, call friends, teammates, and so on. Pablo scores, and then you say that I was a City boy and played in the stands, was cheered for, and so on. The City fans, to my right, I think they must have been in the East End, they're singing for Martin Petrov at Bolton because Bolton are winning. And now Martin's going to stay up for Bolton and QPR are going to go down. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like, like, that was one of the biggest daggers I've ever felt in my career <laughs> to hear that happening. Because it wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. <laughs> I, know, I know that's what it is. I know. But they weren't, just, they weren't like just singing for City to win the league. They're singing for a QPR going down. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm here. <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. So, so we went in at half time, knowing at that point that we were down because Baltimore winning, we were losing. And we needed to come out in the second half and win again. But think of that task. You as QPR, third bottom in the league, away to City, who barely dropped any points at home who are now on the verge of winning a title, not just finishing high, winning a title yeah. to be the best team in the, in the country that year, you now have to try and go out and win the game. Second half came. 
scored one. There were a couple of mistakes. I think Joey made a mistake, scored one. I'm in a funny position now because it's the first ever goal I've celebrated that's gone in against City. But yeah. it's like a subdued one because I'm still, I'm still a fan at heart or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. I want to be respectful. Even though, like, looking back, there was no, there's no value to being respectful. Because like, I didn't score the goal anyway. <laughs> so it was like a mini, like, mini, like, come on. But it just so happened I was right in front of Roberto. So it's like a mini, come on. But not too much. <laughs> then, the, then the second one goes in. Did you look at him like, as well? Did you look at him like, ah. Uh... No, well, I'll bench on that side anyway, so you kind yeah, of got to yeah. look over there. But he, he couldn't care less about me. I'm irrelevant in his life. He probably didn't remember <laughs> me now. That, that's yeah. one thing, that's one lesson I learned, actually. The amount of time you can overthink why people are doing what they're doing to you, but they spend far less time thinking about you than you no, do that's about so them. That's so true. That's so true, yeah. Yeah. So I learned that the hard way, though. So um, you score the second one, and all of a sudden, I'm like, how are we winning this game? And then obviously we go down to 10 men. But like I said earlier, City weren't having the best game of the season at this point, even when we went down to 10 men. Like, it, there was nothing going on. They, had, they were having loose shots and this, that, and the other. But it wasn't like we had five men on the line clearing stuff away and doing this and doing that. Like, that was the angriest Mancini had been in. He's probably two years at City at that point. Because on the sideline, he was cursing everyone. All his team hammering them. You could just hear the Italian swear words flying <laughs> out, attacking his team he was. Fuffin' culo and, and all that. <laughs> They're all of that, every single last bit of it, every single last bit of it. And that there, you know, that was a weird position to be in. To now be winning. I'm City aren't going to win the title. That you're playing right back as well, aren't bit. you? So you're right next to him as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm on that side. I am on that side. But there, I think, then, like, again, we forget how late Edin's goal was. So he scores in, like, the 93rd minute. Kickoff and whatever. And then this is, this is when I got worried now. So it's 2-2. And we're still staying up at this point. I don't know if I've, I've mentioned this to you off air before. but You mentioned the Vinny we, thing, by the way, about, about the throwing to Vinny on the podcast, I yeah. think, which is fascinating. Yeah, so, so for people who haven't heard that, I'm having to take the throw-in on the right-hand side for QPR in the last minute of the game. And it's probably 30 yards away from me. But because I have an, aff an affinity to City, I didn't just walk or do all the time wasting stuff that you'd see from like Gary Neville's in derbies and all that stuff. I did like <laughs> a tiny canter, a tiny canter. I get there, I say to Jay Boffred, I'm going to throw it down the line. I got there, I threw it down the line. He didn't go down the line. So now City have got the ball. And that's what leads to Sergio's goal. That was the last time a QPR player touched the ball before that goal went in. So as I've thrown it and we've lost it, I'm running back in. At no point does the ball come to my side to be able to defend it. But I'm watching the ball move from person to person. People doing this, people touching that, thinking, if this goes in, this is my fault because <laughs> I gave the ball away. <laughs> so I'm absolutely bricking it. Like, bricking it. Because not every mistake is like somebody slipping at the back and someone going through. Like, you yeah, know, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. It. It's decision sometimes. It's a decision like that, yeah. Exactly. I'm, I'm, I'm running back. I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Goal goes in. I'm like, I've just relegated those. So, me, that worst case... Oh, scenario, so, you didn't know at this point? No. Mind. Didn't have a clue. Did not have a clue. I'm like, I've relegated those. And if you see this, the still, if anyone could ever focus on QPR players instead of Sergio running away, you'll see there's like six or seven of us crushed, distraught. But that was only for another 10 seconds because then when we looked at our <laughs> bench, they were celebrating. We looked at our fans on the far side. They were celebrating. <laughs> and in that moment, we realised the bonk game was over and that goal was pointless for us. But it was the biggest goal in City's history at that point. So now everybody inside the stadium celebrating from the players to the benches to the fans. And we've <sighs> done it. And we didn't do it because we won that game or drew that game. We did it because of the result the week before. Like that's yeah. a game which for QPR never gets mentioned, but those three points kept us up. The one you had to win, and basically. You had a chance of winning, you won. That's so exactly, exactly. And things fell in our favour because Bolton essentially collapsed. But for me, personally, again, the fear of, like, have I cost my team, have I cost my team? It meant that for days afterwards, I didn't know who scored the goal. So that Aguero goal or whatever, because I finished the game and the stress level was so high. So after the match, I'm congratulating people, getting catching up with Joe on the field as there's a pitch invasion. And I never thought I'd see a pitch invasion at the Etihad, but I saw it, so it must have been a big deal. But um, catching up to people and all that stuff, we were having beers in our dressing room, they were having champagne and the city won. Got home, I'm like, I want to just detach. The season's over, it's <laughs> sunny. Please just get me home, just get me home. I didn't know who scored that goal for Man City for three, four days afterwards because I just didn't watch TV because it was far too stressful. And myself... 
Jolie and maybe Micah as well for years, up until maybe last year. We'd never even watched the game back. The most really? important iconic game in City's recent history. It's to be honest, stressful. it was a naff game other than like it wasn't yeah. naff, but it was like one of the things where it was just it was a game as I've watched it a thousand times as a City fan, but it's a game fraught with tension to the point where it's not really enjoyable to watch, really. It's yeah. like a, it's one of those yeah. things where it's just a game built around a lot of mistakes as well. Genuinely, it's one of those things yeah. where you could tell it meant so much to both teams that they weren't mm. really on it. I mean did you, did you, um, I guess you didn't realize, but what does it feel like? I mean, obviously, you're a footballer, so you're used to this kind of thing, but, or well, you were a footballer, but what does it feel like to be involved in possibly, and I'm not even saying this as a City fan, I know I'm biased, but it's it possibly the most iconic moment in Premier League history. Like, does that something like, does that mean anything to you at all? Or is it one of those things yeah, where it's just it another day at the office? No, 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 it's absolutely not another day at the office. Like, obviously, our story, our side of the story within it is like the short version of the bigger, the bigger thing. But, yeah. Like we are there to have been in that for that moment. Like the gravity of how that game probably more as years went by. Yeah. Because how when was the last time a Premier League season went down to the last kick of the last game for a team to, to win a league? You know, usually the leagues won like for recent years the league's been won in April, you know, or say two, three games before the end of the season. So as I say, to have to have been there, to have seen it, to have contributed to it, to have played in it. It was something you'll always be able to talk about. And, yeah. you know, the, I have the memories from it. And I'll be honest, throughout the rest of my career, I can talk about the Manchester derbies or this or that, but that's the game which I've spoken about more than any other. And yeah. that says a lot of games, but that is the one which people always go back to because it meant so much, not just the City, not so much just the QPR, but to the Premier League in general and the story yeah, of it. Because, you know, that type of drama is why a lot of people say they love the Premier League. It's not necessarily for a team, like for as good as City are, it's not necessarily a team that will win 25 in a, or 20 in a row that draws them in. But that level of drama that can exist when a team stays up on the last day or a team does something on the last day or in the last moment or the last kick in a very yeah. unexpected, dramatic fashion. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it was an, looking back, it was an honour to have been a part of it. It was very, very stressful. And I was also very lucky because in the end, our result didn't matter. Like we could have in that we could have basically lost that game ten nil, and still stayed up. But the fact is, we were in a game until the last kick of it, yeah. and then it led to them winning the league. <clears throat> but I was staying up at the same part, and that was the only time I was in a stadium where everybody in there was celebrating, even for were different you, um, reasons. Everybody was celebrating. Were you involved in like the pitch? Did anyone grab you on the pitch or anything like that? Or were you straight yeah. off the pitch at the end? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, was no, like, no. Oh, need him. Because, no, I wasn't straight off because I had to go. I, for me personally, Joe Hart is a really good friend of mine. Yeah. I wanted to go and congratulate him because I saw the start of the season, the stuff they were going through to get to that point. Yeah. You know, I left halfway through a season. So I have a level of empathy towards what they were trying to achieve and how hard they worked for it. So I think I saw Vinny and I saw Micah and I went to see Joe specifically and we hugged on the field. But this is where the sort of detachment came, where fans were so delirious about the fact that you've just won the league. They're like celebrating with Joe, but they're also trying to celebrate with me. But like, I don't, I'm like, I don't play for City. You know what I mean? Like, even when I left the stadium, someone's like, oh, we did it. I was like, yeah, 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 we did. Yeah, we did. Uh, yeah, we did stay up. I was like, oh, did you? Oh, congratulations. Yeah. Like, you, you forget. I've been there for so long. You forget that like, I'm not there representing City. I was yeah, there yeah. for another reason. And that, you know, it was a, it was a very, very special moment. One I will never forget. Uh, I, I know I am once again. I, I'm definitely biased, but I... I... Honestly, don't think, at least in my lifetime and probably ours, um, I don't think we'll see a moment like that again in Premier League history. And it's not because of, um, it's not because it was a great goal in the last minute. It was because of what it meant. It was because of the story of Manchester City and Manchester United. This, this is one thing that my best mate of United fans, they don't accept it when I say it, but I say you will never experience what City fans went through that day. And you never will. Not because you won a game in the last kick. I know you did that against Champions League, but there was no head-to-head -head with Bayern and Man United that meant anything. It was the fact that how they did it. It was the fact that Fergie was on the pitch there. It was the fact that we got to throw years of pain back in the faces. Um, it was uh, a moment for a reason. Um, because it was years mm -hmm. and years and years of bottled up um, pain. So I absolutely loved it. And uh, even though it was indirect, thank you for your part in that, Nathan. <laughs> I really yeah. appreciate that. <laughs> to, to jump in as well, just quickly, I think for the City fans and stuff, I think it's, 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 like a, it's beautiful as well because it came from a moment of despair. As yes, the board exactly. went up for, for added time, it's happened again. We've, you know, even when we've made it, we've not made it. Yeah. And instead, it's the best five minutes That's what of makes the it whole beautiful. season. 
That's what makes yeah, it beautiful. Exactly. And honestly, they say that whole cliche about how you couldn't write it, and you would genuinely struggle to. Oh, to be honest, that is a Hollywood ending. Someone sat there and yeah. gone all the moving parts, put them together. Years of pain, years of previous struggle, throwing it away with a typical city thing, and then you've got your rivals celebrating. You think you've messed up against a team being relegated with X players on the pitch. It's just, it's just beautifully written. Genuinely, it should win yeah. awards. Yet it happened, and that's why football's amazing and um, yeah, uh, sure, incredible, yeah. man. But I, I'm, I'm glad you were there, you know, in your own way, because obviously. Um, you're an eloquent man and you, you appreciate what you've been a part of and um, you need people like yourself there to tell the story from your perspective because um, yeah. it's important. It's important. I'm genuinely honoured to talk about it, man. Um, are you all right to run for you a few other questions genuinely about like the pressure in football stuff like that? Yeah, for sure. have yeah. been chatting Absolutely, for a while, yeah. man, but, but I'm loving Absolutely, this conversation. Yeah. Um, I did put, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I did tweet out about the idea of this um, chat and some people came back with some really interesting points and it's a massive kind of segue into a different thing. I, was, I had more City questions, but to be honest, I can't really top that that general discussion then so let's go on to um just really about the pressures around athletes in the game and and also i guess how um being a footballer affects you personally now you, you're clearly a very measured you know young man and you obviously understand um how, how to manage yourself off the pitch but it, that doesn't come easy for everyone you know it isn't easy no. to um i guess separate what you've been told from the realities of the world and um i guess just get by in a day-to-day -day basis when you've been I guess not mummy cuddles are probably the right word, but you've had your life so regimented where you need to be at all times and all that kind of stuff. Um, do you feel like, um, uh, do you feel like, and this is a, once again, a slightly different thing. Do you feel like you missed part of, I guess, growing up being a footballer? Um, and what I mean by that is that I spent my twenties, uh, just being a dick, man, <laughs> messing around, enjoying <laughs> myself, you know, and I could do that with absolute zero responsibilities. I wasn't going to be on the back page if I was stumbling out 42s in Manchester, making a tit on myself, you know, whereas, um, that definitely happens to footballers and, um, someone, yeah, someone asked this on Twitter, like, how did you feel about that? I guess missing your twenties, missing your young, um, adulthood because young men were famously stupid sometimes and you don't get yeah. a chance to be, do you? You know, how did that no, feel no. for you growing up? No, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. It's something that we think about, I think, probably more when, like, we li so we'll leave, some people leave high school, they won't go to yeah. college and so on. But even when I was in college, uh, as a variant, I'm there, and I'm next, sitting next to someone who is a student, but yeah. I've got different expectations. You know, I'm not there for the full time, and I've got other things which I need to be doing. And, like, that's fine. But then it's the next year, it's like the 18 to 21, 22, where people go into university and talking about all the experiences where they're essentially becoming, they're becoming adults, but after the freshman year, you know, you know, yeah, like yeah. they're like, they're doing things, they're doing this, they're doing that. And there's a sense of finally getting, gaining freedom and allowed to do whatever. And don't get me wrong, the trade-off between that and being a professional footballer, playing in some of the best stadiums, being played really well, getting to play the game that you love and having a job is great. But there are certain things which you do feel like you miss out on because you are young enough to, you know, to have, as you said, the being or whatever. Like you can, that is, <laughs> that's very close to being available. But the downside is in those instances, if you choose to try and do both things as a player, you lose one of them. And that is usually the right to be a professional footballer. Like if yeah. you want to be distracted, you'll lose the opportunity because it's such a, uh, it's like a, such a dog eat dog environment that if you, slip up doesn't matter what your talent level is someone else will come in and they'll take an opportunity and ultimately think of it like being um you know it can be the best goalkeeper in the world but if somebody's playing ahead of you you're not going to get any games like that's just yeah. that's just what it is it's a one in one out or that's just how it just how it goes and um yeah you do you do feel like you miss some miss out on some stuff and then as you get older like i've missed the feeling of knowing that I can go to people's weddings. I can be take part in people's birthdays, take part in big social events yeah. and stuff like that. And it is tough, but like I say, there is, there is a trade-off. I would have loved to have been able to do it, to be able to book time off. But I think when you play in football, you start to realise that the football world is all-encompassing. That's what you're part of. You're not part of the world as such, and you have to follow these rules. But yeah. I think also with that, that's where some people probably become lost because they think that the football world is the real world so the stuff yeah. and the things which they see there and the things which they do they think that's normal but a career when you look at it isn't a very long time at all especially after you step away from it like when you start at, when you're going full-time at 16 and you maybe retire when you're 40 you know you've got 24 years and that's over half of your life of playing football but you don't finish football and then you pass away touch wood anyway you've maybe got another 60 years ahead of you in a world yeah. that isn't football so it's um 
I think it's understanding of why if you I think if, as a youngster if you understand why you're doing what you're doing then you can accept the things that you miss out on but for some people that's more so obsessed by the perks of being somebody who can live their life as a youngster as opposed to the stuff which ultimately changes your life long term by being committed at those early young phases because it creates a foundation to be able to have a career that lasts for as long as possible yeah of course man um you touched on the word that actually which i was thinking about anyway uh, change um uh football and money and fame and temptation changes people um did you feel like um i know you come from a very you know uh, strong family background and so on but do you did you feel like um uh i guess when you you got that fame and you got that success and um, do you feel like it changed anyone around you as such i mean obviously it's a relative personal yeah. question i don't mind if you um want to avoid it but did you notice from friends for example did you were you hearing from people you hadn't spoken to for a while or anything like that i mean yeah. does it feel like you do, do, do you sense a big change in how you treat it as people yeah there is a there is a big change but it depends on your sort of family setup and your friend setup i think as years got went by my friends group from when i first started playing my friends group got large but then as i got older it got smaller and smaller because i started yeah. to realize that some people weren't necessarily there as a friend they were there because of the status itself you know, whereas the people who I have with me now, whether they work in football or outside, are outside, they're always there for me as myself, as opposed to whatever I did. So nothing has changed from December through to now when I'm not playing anymore. But as it's, it's, a, it's one of those things where people, um, football, being a footballer is a celebrity, especially in a place like Manchester. If you play for City or play for United, you can't really yeah. walk very far down the street and people don't recognize who you are. But it's just a case of how do you then react to those things? Because for some people, if you play up to it and you want to live by that, then you'll come across tons of people who will only behave a certain way around you because they think you're of value. But those are the dangerous ones because when they believe you lose your value, they disappear. And they usually disappear. And when you lose your value is when you need people the most. So it's a, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22 yeah. type thing. But it's, it's normal because people like you love Man City. I love Man City. People love their football teams. So if you love the football teams, you love the players who play for the teams, especially when they're doing well. So people instinctively just be different around you. And there's that sense of knowing you as well. Even if you've never met someone, you think you've not, you know them because you've seen them on TV a hundred times now. You know, you've been in the stadium and seen them. You shout, you shout, I'm sure you shout something to them and they look to you and they wink to something, you know. It's oh, yeah, well yeah. done, such and such. And like, yeah, yeah, thank you. You know, there's that. <laughs> So I think you do get treated differently, but it's just a case of how you perceive it because there, there are plenty of people who, when, you know, when I was younger, plenty of people I came up with as well, who would go to a nightclub and refuse to queue because they'd get to the front and say, I am such and such, I am this. But for me personally, I would always queue and then I'd get to the front. If they said I got the wrong shoes, I'll just go somewhere else. You know, there are different ways to perceive it. You will be treated differently if you want to be treated differently but if you make a focus on being you know just not doing that then people treat you right and you find the right people around you but when you want to live in that sort of fantasy football bubble you know at some point you'll face disappointment whether it's early in your career or at the end of it yeah, you're going to have to grow up eventually, aren't you? Because um, it's going to mm. kind of slap me in the face reality. Um, one thing that you touched about, obviously, like um, there's a little bit of like uh, people treating you differently. Um, and of course, sadly, um, I'm not sure how you much you went near social media, but there's a lot of things where fans probably treat you very differently depending if it's online or in person. Um, I mm-hmm. don't really know how much you, you paid attention to these things, but one thing we, we've seen a lot, and I spend a lot of time in the social media bubble, and um, it's crazy what people will say to you on, online and not then say to your face in person. Yeah, um, for sure. Um, for sure. Yeah. You, you must have um, sensed this. I mean, how? I mean, I don't. For one, I don't know if it's something that affects you personally, but maybe it's players around you or friends in, in the game. I mean, how um, is it spoken about the, the effects of social media on players? Because I mean, we've seen stuff as well, like some of the, the especially the racist abuse that some uh, players are getting recently on Twitter and all that kind of stuff. It's been absolutely insane. I mean, um, how how do you cope? with social media uh, as a football because you only just retired and you're of the age to understand it all as well um yeah. was that a thing that was often discussed within the game professionally yeah it is and it isn't i think um because we're of the same generation we've come to a point where social media at one point was never a thing you know we could yeah. talk about aol messengers talk about chat rooms and stuff like that or yeah, even that that way. exactly yeah <laughs> or times when you know, if you want to meet up with somebody, you call their house phone and tell them what time to be there and you hope that they are there at that time. <laughs> but then you're yeah. also at this stage now where you can be tracking someone to see where they are and you can ping them and so on. So, it's the, you know, we've seen the different progression of it and that social media element has been a big thing and a big factor within football in terms of how players have to be now. Because 
it's more than just stuff that happens on the field. You can have players who could maybe have better careers or be perceived in a better manner because they can control their image more because they have a footprint on social media. So yeah. everyone understands yeah. the importance of it. Don't get me wrong, you can be a player who doesn't have it, but then it means that if you, you people are going to speak for you more often. Yeah. Um, so as far as the social media thing goes, I think it's affected people. Like for me personally, like I really don't like Twitter overall, just because like at times it can be a really toxic, toxic environment. No, you're right, but, it's a cesspit. Man, I spend too much time but, with it, but it is a cesspit. But that's where I think that comes through that sort of feel of anonymity in the same way that you've got so many angry drivers when they're behind the wheel, but the equivalent things happen on the street and they wouldn't be as confrontational because your identity is right there in yeah. front of someone to be able to deal with. And unfortunately, any place where you find that anonymity, people will just find stuff funny. And I was on Twitter for maybe six months. And, you know, you, you disre- like I, I overall don't care about the, opinion, the opinions, especially negative ones of people who I don't know. If what yep. they're saying isn't true, like I, like I don't care because it doesn't affect me. Like someone could, for my career, could have said I was crap every single day. But if my coach thinks I'm good and my teammates like me, I'll play every single week. Yeah. So I won't hang my head on like the person, put my hat on the person saying I'm crap. I'll focus on what the manager wants me to do and me doing a good job for him and my teammates. That's it. That's a fact. But I remember one time I was in, when I was on Twitter, I was just in Nando's and I was waiting for an order. And then all of a sudden someone's added me in the Nando's saying, oh, look, he's sitting on the bench now. I'd best get used to it for the rest of the season. I'm like, it's just... <laughs> I'm like, oh, hell, man. Uh, yeah, you know, like I'm looking around like who said that? But then no one's saying oh, it was me, it was me, it was me. It's just like that's just the way that it works. And it's a shame. It's a shame that it's like that. And it's a shame as well, because those people essentially make up a minority. But they're, they're loud, aren't they? They're loud. They're as people so think. loud. And then for some of the people who have the bigger followings, even if one percent of people don't like it, you know, when it's one person out of a hundred, fine. But when you're talking about a hundred thousand followers and a thousand people are on your case. That hits a bit different because you're hearing a lot of pings throughout a day of people throwing abuse at you. Um, yeah. So this this whole social media conversation, like some people take it very personally. And I think you just look at society these days and some of the young kids, the fact that, you know, they're having to delete posts if he doesn't get enough likes in a certain amount of time and stuff like this. Yeah. Like those, we need to trans- understand that we transfer those feelings and emotions and those children into professional football as well, where you're now having more of an audience and more of a criticism because, you know, if someone doesn't, someone feels attacked because they didn't get enough likes as a normal person. And then you put that person in a field whereby it's not about the number of likes. It's about the amount of negative comments and things like this. Like from a sort of mental health standpoint, it's, it's tough out there, but unfortunately social media has a value because for the good people out there to be able to interact with players and fans and so on, it's worthwhile, but it's the loud ones that that ruin and people unfortunately have to live with that. And you can't, as was the case with, say when fans say certain things in stands as a player you can't react because for whenever you do you're the one who'll be punished and not the fan themselves so you're constantly having to bite your tongue and you know that makes it probably worse for a lot of people yeah of course i mean i don't really know how to approach this question because i don't want to also at the same time fuel idiots because you don't want uh, and think they've won but at the same time you can't help as a fan and be curious um and i genuinely am a bit conflicted by this but i guess I mean, I would never expect you to name names either, of course. But, I mean, have you ever seen any cases where a player has been affected by criticism from fans on social media and take it personally? I mean, once again, I mean, obviously, I can hopefully, I presume that's a minority, but is it an issue like that? You know, have you seen it affecting players' confidence and stuff? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, like I don't, I wouldn't necessarily name people directly, but when you see the way the football is, um, especially for the younger players. Like, like I say, I'm an older player, so ultimately my footprint on social media is slight. Like, I have a private account, whatever. Like, if someone wants to write to me, fine. I don't, it doesn't affect me because I see the big picture. But for yeah. some of these people who were with social media from the start of their careers, they're constantly seeking validation for how they're playing and what they're doing. Whereas if I ever sought it, it'd be from my teammates and from the management. But for the people coming through, it's been more than that. And sometimes you look at people and they might have a bad game and you can see their heads dropping lower and lower and lower. But in the real world, you're not being attacked by your teammates. You're not being attacked by the manager. Yeah. But you're seeing their confidence get lower and lower and lower. And you're thinking, well, what's, where's that coming from? Because you know when you've had a bad game and so on, but not to yeah. the point where it almost feels like an overreaction based on the real world. And that's when you know for some people, it's the stuff that's from the outside that's affecting them in a greater manner. Whether it's, you know, people hearing abuse about, you know, the way they've played about them in general and so on. And you can see 
you can see it affects people because it, as you can say as much like I said I brush stuff off and I do but I do spend a second to read it I still read it and the 99 positive comments you could receive compared to the one negative one I see easier to remember the one negative as opposed to the 99 I, I, I know exactly how you feel about that I get yeah you know I've, what I mean? I've, yeah I've been in my head about negative comments on YouTube videos and it's it's nonsense but you you, you, yeah. you, you, you naturally as a human hone in on those comments don't you you can't help exactly. it I don't know what it is about it but Exactly. I mean, like, especially because it's not justified. That's the thing. For some, if something is justified, you can always hold your hands up. Yeah. But if someone says something which is unjustified, yeah, exactly, like in yeah. this, in in this field of social media and stuff that we live in, like, let me be. I don't know if it's controversial, or whatever. But unless you're you doing something for an algorithm for the website, or whatever, to dictate what your field feed uh, feed looks like, there's no reason to dislike a video because if you don't like a video, just don't watch the video. If you don't like a person, don't follow the person. Yes, though we have people who exist in that space just to dislike everything and to criticize everything, but you have freedom to go elsewhere. So why not have a following of people who want to be there as opposed to a bunch of people who want to be there just to wind, just to try and wind people up? Because at the end of the day, it's a real person on the other side and they wouldn't yeah. do it in real life. You know, that's, no. but I don't know, maybe I'm ranting. No, no, you, no, you've summed up uh, an awful lot of how I feel on a daily basis um, about it's crazy, isn't it? especially when you feel, it's, that's the thing, especially when you feel like you've done nothing wrong. Um, mm. And I guess, um, and I can only speak for myself there, but I, I, I shouldn't care as much as I do, but sometimes it's hard not to. And I can be sat there having a good day and someone will just find a way just to cut right through. And it's crazy how mm -hmm. it can shift your mood. And, and I guess, I guess yeah. the broader point is that some of these fans don't realise... <laughs> And you want to use fans in inverted commas, but I don't really think that accomplishes anything because they are fans, unfortunately. They're dickheads, but they're still fans. And we can do that. Oh, they're not yeah. real fans of this club, but they are. <laughs> they're just fortunately, yeah. like it doesn't solve anything to just deflect this idea that they're not fans. And what I guess they don't realize is that they can quite literally, in a negative way, affect the club. Um, by It could just be that they knock player X down with one bad comment just before a game and I guess they think that they'd be constructive so I'm trying to make that player move on but they're just digging a trench themselves and, and I guess it sounds cliche but honestly the whole supporting thing um, it really is the best best route isn't it just genuinely help and get behind the players yeah. especially the trying man I'm like it just it yeah. bugs me man it I, really bugs me I, I, think, I think I think you're entitled you're perfectly entitled to believe whether someone's a good player bad player so on and yeah. so forth but underneath that they're people as well you know, and if someone's not playing well, you don't necessarily need to tell them they're not playing well because I can tell you directly, players know when they're not playing well and they don't essentially get better by being told over and over by people that they're not playing well because you get it, that's when people start digging a hole for themselves. And when you look at it through football and the amount of times where we've had players come to clubs who haven't been fancied that well, but further down the line, they end up coming good for them. They come good because people have faith to them or they yeah. don't necessarily try and drag them down. And yeah, I don't know. For me, I don't know. It's just it's a it's a life choice. But for me, if if I've not got something good to say about a certain individual or whatever, I just won't say it. As opposed to try and drag them down and make things worse for them, because you know, at the end of the day, they're entitled to have a, a relatively stress free life without me just trying to make it worse for no apparent reason for no benefit. That that sounds an awful lot like common sense, native, and that's not allowed online. Um, yeah, one thing you touched on there um, is the idea. I mean, you actually mentioned about like form, and this is something I've always wondered. I know a lot of fans feel this way as well. Like, um, how does it feel to be in bad form? Like, are you are you consciously aware? I mean, like, how do you even? I guess um, how do, what's it like to have that low confidence at the moment? And I guess one thing as well, an extension of this point is you played for your boyhood club, and this is me personally, so I'm not projecting this onto you, but I would probably feel more bad if I had a bad game yeah. playing for the club that I yeah. support. I mean, is it how do you, how do you separate yourself from that feeling? Because it, it must hang over you <laughs> to a little bit, surely. Yeah, it, it took me it took me a while to separate those because for those first two, three, four years or whatever, things like Manchester derbies, if we lost, I wouldn't you wouldn't see me for a week. I wouldn't even leave my house, you know, because that stuff that stuff matters. You know, I felt embarrassed, and I think as um, as a player going through bad form, I think as I got older, the key is to realize why you're in bad form. And unfortunately, when you're younger, you sort of overthink things sometimes. Yeah, because some of the skills and stuff that we have you play your best when you can just do it automatically and not think things through. And that's why the game of football at times isn't necessarily for people who are overthinkers. So somebody, some people who are essentially daft can play the game really well. Yeah. Because they've not even realized, <laughs> because they've not really realized that the thing that they did up there cost the team the goal. You know, they just keep, keep moving. Whereas for other people, they understand the consequences. They understand what they've, what they've done has caused this, which has meant that, which has done this. 
oh, but now I need to make sure that I do this. Oh, I've given the ball away two, three times. I need to really make sure this next pass is the right thing. And from there, you know, you, you basically paralyze yourself and to get and to be in bad form isn't great. But then there are lots of different ways to be in bad form because you could be in bad form and still be playing, in which case you're being criticized by fans and so on. Or you could be in bad form and now you're out of the team and you're wondering how do you get back into the side, especially when the team's doing well. Yeah. Or even the opposite of that, you could be in bad form and it looks like you might have to leave. But then how do you get better? How do you find a way to get better? And that's when really supportive environment environments really matter. And also it's the reasons for the bad form because ultimately whoever comes to a club is deemed to be a good enough player to play for the side. But sometimes the things going on away from the field and so on, which affect them. And those conversations don't happen very often where you try and act, figure out what that is. And even as yeah. a player, again, there's so many players who across the years go out onto the pitch and they're not 100% fit. But the reason they're out there is because they're committed to do the best that they absolutely can for the team. And they're playing through pain, but they can't do things the same way they would do when they're fit. So they're showing yeah. heart, showing commitment. The same thing that a fan would do if they had the same opportunity. But unfortunately, every time you step out, you get judged as if everything's great in your life and you're perfect health and everything's great for you. But it's, you know, very rarely is that the case for everybody. But that's how we judge people. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. I mean, and once again, I won't get you to comment because it's about current play from Manchester City. But for example, I've seen, I think he's had a great start, but I've seen someone talk about Ferran Torres online as like being a bit disappointing. It's like, you've got to bear in mind, this is a young lad who joined, moved to England during a pandemic where we can't mm-hmm. go out and do anything at any point. He's 20 years old. He's literally a baby in the grand scheme of things, meeting new teammates, no time to settle, no time just to walk around Manchester and experience it and feel that sense of home, I guess. And like, how does this kind of stuff, then he also even caught COVID as well. How does this kind of stuff not affect a player i do sometimes wish that people would consider that they are human beings you know, that you are yeah. a human being that you know that there's that this stuff affects you man and like and I, so mm. this sounds once again i don't this sounds narcissistic but i looked at my videos back at the start of the pandemic they were shy <laughs> literally i was sat there <laughs> I, they were literally i was sat there looking really miserable and i couldn't hide it and like and i'm just one of billions of people on this planet and if i can sit there and make nonsense videos about football and feel down imagine the pressure i guess of making you know playing at a mm. high level where there's that competition for places and you're you're living such a weird life which football is a weird life i guess you know um i guess mm-hmm. i guess the point i'm making is that people don't usually attach um common sense to the viewing a player and you no. have to view him as Mitchell. and i guess it's also i guess it's not really a surprise why people like joao cancelo and rodri seem better in the second season i mean do you have you found that personally have you noticed players suddenly just yeah. adapt to a, a, a to place and feel better yeah 100 100 you know, yeah like if you you look at someone like, like uh, Ruben Diaz and he's coming and he's been playing. He started playing well straight away. But if he came in and he was struggling a bit at the start, think what it'd be like for him to have the self-doubt to think, is this the right league for me? But if you yeah. start well, your chest goes out. Like someone like uh, Fran Torres, he would probably admit himself that he hasn't played the best for Man City in this moment. But he yeah. knows that he's got more to come. If this was him at his maximum and he says, this is great, then I think criticism is right. But he's probably be, these players, players in general, they know when they're not doing well and they want to do better. But they've got to find ways to do that. But to just be pointed fingers saying you're this, you're saying you're that, like he's a long way from home. He's not playing week in, week out. The people playing ahead of him are literally on fire right now. And he's a young kid. Like this is his first time in his life when he's having to deal with some of these situations probably. Because where yeah. he came from, you know, he is potentially the big star. He's going to be the next this. But now you're just part of a team. And the team is doing very, very well. And you're not currently either understanding tactics or you've not got your shooting boots on. You know, so it's, it's a very, very tough situation to find yourself in. And people, once you do feel settled, when you don't have to worry about your family, worry about the culture, worry about whatever, worry about being selected. Football at its best is, for me, one of the best jobs in the world. It's incredible. When you're playing well, your team's doing well. You turn up to train, have a great time at training, turn up to games, play well in games, win games, laugh and joke after a game, celebrate, go on to the next one. Like, you're rolling. But when you're on the other side of it, you're not playing well, you're not winning games, things aren't great outside of football. It's hard because you can never see when it's going to change. Like, form is one of those things, like, you never know, you hope it's going to change. And you try and do everything to make it change, but it doesn't guarantee it'll change. And at some point, you get taken out because your form isn't where it needs to be. And then how do you react? Because then you need opportunity to break your form. You know, it's it's tough. 
they can be really, really tough, especially for young players in new situations. So I understand why maybe he's not done the best this season. But if they keep faith in him and the manager believes in him, and the club overall are very good at helping people adjust, like he'll be fine. He really will be fine. But you know, to judge somebody so young at this stage now, based on what he's done so far, I think it's a it's a tough bar to have because basically we've, we've dehumanized Man City players because they win twenty odd games in a row. And that's of course, shame, really. I mean, I saw people complaining because we conceded the goal at one point, which it sounds insane. But that's, I guess, there's um, you, you're sometimes guilty by being excellent. At the same time, you can be so good that it comes about to bite you in the arse, and it's a weird time. I mean, uh, I guess finally, man, like, what do you feel like? Do you find? Uh, maybe not but do you feel like more of a City fan now you've retired again I mean is there like um, yeah. does it feel like it's changed for you your relationship's changed because you've been a player you were a fan before that and now I guess you've got this time like, I mean has your relationship with Manchester yeah. City changed in any shape or form since December yeah it has um, it's, I'd go back further in December so I'll be I'll be completely honest with you so when when I first started heavy City fan time passed I was still a City fan but I was playing because so yeah. that's my job and I wanted the best for us, but us happened to be the team I supported anyway, so it just fit. But certain losses and stuff, I wouldn't take as hard as I did when I was younger because I understood that like, I'm actually on the other side. I'm not a fan in a kit. I'm a City player in a kit, and I happen to support the club anyway. Um, and you lose the sort of sense of the magic of, you know, when you see the, when you see the club once a week on a Saturday, like that's yeah. the club for you. But when you see how it all works, it's different because it's, it's your work. Um, then... Everything was fine. But then the Mancini years, I really struggled. Like, I'll be honest, I really didn't like Roberto Mancini at all as a human being. Like, him as a coach was fine because he did whatever he did. But he, I really didn't like him as a person. So him at the helm of the club was a tough one for me because yeah. I didn't, it wasn't just me on the outside seeing it. Like, if you're on the outside and you see Mancini and you see the success that the team has, like, that's fine. But when you're inside and you see how he gained the success and the person that he is, you know it's down to the... Like, for me, I know it's that he's... Tactically, he was good and so on. But a lot was on the players there. So when I left, especially the way that I did leave, it was harder to support the team at that point, support the club, because he was there and for as well as they were doing. He was, you know, he was the face of it and he was receiving praise, which at times I knew he didn't deserve for who he was yeah. as a person. So that was tough. And I had people who were my friends who were there who were unhappy, essentially, even though the club was successful. They were unhappy because of him. You know, there was a point where some players might be going if he didn't go and things like this, which was like a crazy spot to be in. Um, but then he left. Pellegrini came in, I think, and it started to feel a bit more for the team. But then at the same time, some of my old teammates and friends then started to leave the club yeah. and they were being treated badly. So again, I'm siding more so with them. I can't disregard their feelings because I was there with them. So again, I'm still technically a fan, but not quite wholeheartedly. And then Pep came in. And apart from the thing with Joe Hart, like I loved Pep as a player. I loved Pep as a manager. And it seemed like the club was being readied for Pep to come to Man City. So he yeah. came in. I was elsewhere. We weren't playing against City as such. Most of my friends there had left, but some of the staff remained. So now I'm watching them as a fan. All of a sudden, I'm now in a place where, like when I was younger, I'm supporting a team where I don't know all the players in the team. So <laughs> I'm just watching them. And everybody I know essentially is left. And I don't have relationships with people in that side. So now I am literally back in the same spot that I was at before, where I don't know the inner workings of it. I don't know people who have been emotional about this decision making, but I know that the team, they wear blue. And that's the blue that I love because that's who I supported as a kid. So now it's a lot easier to support us. But, you know, and obviously then winning every single week does help. But to know that I wasn't a glory seeker to be supporting my city, <laughs> uh, you know, that's like, a, that's like a badge you need to have next to the badge itself. Because yeah, definitely. People want to criticize, you know, when you say you're a city fan. But it's enjoyable to see where they came from, to be where they're at now, and to see the success with a guy who, as a, like, I trained with Pep Guardiola. Like, a guy came on trial at City under Stuart Pearce. Like, I remember that. Oh, I was in awe that day. Yeah. I was literally in awe that day. I was like, why is Pep Guardiola just there next to me on the oh, field? How was, how was he? Icon. Yeah, he wasn't, he wasn't as good as he was at his prime. <laughs> but the fact is, he's still, that's like, that's, that's, like, that's, Pep, that's Pep Guardiola. You know what I mean? Like, that's, yeah. he, was in, he was nuts. So, to see him come that far and to be there and for him to bring that style which he has to Man City feels like a privilege and it's you know I'm proud I'm proud of, uh, I'm proud to say I'm a City fan and even with the investment that came in 
I think for as much as people want to criticise City and so on and so forth, they've done more in my eyes for the community in the city of Manchester in that time than say lots of other owners would, would have done as well. So it seems like yeah. there's an investment in more than just the stuff on the field because I've been at those clubs where the investment is just on the field and it tends not to work out too well. So I'm happy to say that you know I support the club and it seems like they have they want to keep their identity even though the success is at a level which we never even thought would be possible. And Aidan, that's um, a perfect way to end it. Uh, thank you so, so much, mate. It's been a genuine honour. Um, and I can honestly say hand and heart, it's one of those things as we talked about at the start. It's just sometimes you find yourself sit back and listening. And it's, uh, as I guess someone like myself, it's genuinely been fantastic. Um, thank you so much, man. It's been an honour to have you. Um, once again, I would recommend to everyone, go and listen to Nadam's uh, podcast. It's genuinely brilliant. It's, it's more like this, but with a better host and better guests. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, no, no. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Mate, it's been an absolute honour. Guys, thank you for watching. Um, once again, thank you to Nadim. Nadim has been absolutely brilliant. Um, of course, if you like this, let me know down in the comments and make sure to do the like, comment, subscribe and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but for now, though, the thing, is it down there? Is it down there? Is it down there? Where is it? It's, Hit the like button. It's, down there. It's, you'll be on that side. So it's right, right below you, actually. Yeah, so. <laughs> you click, click the, click, make sure to like and comment and click the button. So you don't miss out hey, on anything in the future. There we there go. There you go. Do, do what Chief says, man. Do what Chief... Where did that nickname come from, by the way? Where did that nickname come from? That was... That was just, a, it was an academy coach. She just, the way I carried myself, she just decided to call me chief. And from that moment, people found it easier to call me chief than native. So I just became chief wherever I went. Mate, it's class. I hope you're still sticking to this day. Uh, thank you so much yeah. once again. Proper ending this time. See you later, guys.